Hello and um, good afternoon everyone and um, welcome to this session introducing um, the Transformed Labour Force Survey. My name is Jen and I'm from the UK Data Service User Support and Training Team. And so to get started, I'm really pleased to open this session on the Transformed Labour Force Survey. The LFS is a really important survey and it's fantastic that the ONS are, have joined us today to talk through some of the changes that are happening with the survey during the next year. So today's speakers are Orla Fraser and she's head of the statistical transformation for social surveys at the office for national statistics and has been responsible for the design of the transformed labor force survey and we'll also have james harris so he's head of the labor force survey at the office for national statistics and has been responsible for running the current labor force survey and annual population survey and leading on engagements uh, with users around the transformation so uh, as Jen introduced, so hello, James Harris, head of the current Labour Force Survey. So working with Martina to get out the numbers that all you, you're all currently using and uh, working in partnership with all uh, designing the new thing that you're going to be getting. So we are now in our 50th year. So collecting the Labour Force Survey for 50 years on the labour market, demographics, various aspects of people's everyday lives. But right now we're having to think about the digital age Although the survey has been evolving over many years, big massive change to the structure of the, the population, the way in which surveys are conducted, the new technologies that we have available. So this transformation is bringing us very much fully into the digital age and in our 50th year as well. Thinking about all the various uses of the data. So some of you have given some very good answers, but a whole bunch of publications and statistics and outputs uh, make use of our information all across government. You have various outputs by the ONS itself, things like the beyond GDP measures, breakdowns of families and households, analysis of disability, analysis of adult smoking habits, analysis of aging, all sorts of publications that ONS produces on a regular basis based upon the LFS data. We obviously make our, our information uh, available through this Q research service, the UK data service, NOMIS, uh, all sorts of mechanisms for yourselves, other users, uh, academics, think tanks, local authorities, whomever, to get access to the data should they want to. And part of that analysis includes uh, feeding into things like the Health and Safety Executive, the uh, Institution for uh, occupation and, uh, Occupational Safety and Health, all sorts of analyses of various topics like health and safety at work, like uh, technology with Tech UK, like the Sustainable Development Goals, analysis of social mobility, analyses by the Race Disparity Unit, which is in the Cabinet Office, looking at potential inequalities in both the population and the labour market, looking at different characteristics of people, breakdowns by age and sex and location and everything else to investigate the, the current status of the economy. And of course, an awful lot of analyses by uh, local authorities, local users, especially in the, the light of the leveling up agenda. So breakdowns of the analysis by uh, local authority, by age, by sex, by ethnicity, by employment status, analyses of uh, specific disability groups, health groups and everything else, feeding into things like the in local industrial strategies and the local policies and local deliveries in, in uh, different policy areas. So an awful lot of use of this data and that's hopefully why you're all here today because you do some of these uses of the data and then you're engaged in some of this analysis as well. Um, but what, what this means for the survey itself, well, We've been continually adjusting the design of the survey over the course of many years for the changing population and environment, but we haven't done a, a full branch, a root and branch review of the questionnaire, the structure, the flow, the content, everything from the bottom, uh, bottom up. We have unfortunately seen a steady decline in the response rates over the last 25 years or possibly longer for a whole variety of reasons, concerns about the confidentiality of how we handle the data, mis uh, a growing sense of mistrust with the government, the changes to the structure of the population, so an increase in gated communities, an increase in both single person and temporary households, and of course single person temporary households as well. A bunch of different changes to the population and, and our target audience for conducting this survey and of course some industry-wide complexities all sorts of uh, things affecting the survey industry so difficulty in recruiting interviewers uh, public fatigue with taking surveys and calls uh, the global move to online interactions and uh, the in introduction of smartphones and tablets which change the way in which people uh, interact with surveys going forwards and uh, i've put on here as well public fatigue you go go to a shop get a receipt you go to 
to a shop, you get a, a review of how well did we serve you today. You go to a restaurant, how well did we serve you today? There are only so many surveys that people can handle. So unfortunately, we have seen a drop in the number of interviews, but that's largely why we're going into this transformational process. So thinking about the transformation where we're going. So the objectives of us transforming the survey, we are taking an online first approach. So rather than the old survey used to be face to face first, now it's online first with a new adaptive and responsive design so that we are targeting our activities, our resources, our field work capacity and everything else to the most efficient, uh, in the most efficient way to maximize the number of responses we get, but not just the number of responses we get, the representativeness of those responses, the quality of the responses that we're getting, the overall improvements to the survey, which include a larger overall sample size. So the wave one of the transformed survey is far larger than the current wave one of the uh, current LFS. I think it's seven times the size of, is wave one. Uh, more robust processing systems, so making sure that we're able to produce the data as accurately, consistently, error free as possible, and ideally as quickly and, and easily as possible as well. Uh, adapting the design to reduce the bias, so uh, introducing uh, options, alternatives, changes to the survey designs so that we're reducing the bias and improving the representativeness, uh, making the survey hopefully more flexible and adaptable to uh, respond to change. Things like when COVID get to uh, uh, impact the population, making sure that we're able to make immediate changes as much as possible so that we can then collect the best information for the latest uh, economic, environmental and policy outcomes and uh, updating and upgrading the questions. As I said, this has been going for 50 years, so making sure that we're asking the most relevant questions that we possibly can in the best possible way. And of course, we ha do have future aims, so a bunch of those changes have already happened. Some of them are being implemented over the coming few months as well, but we're planning to uh, add administrative data, trying to increase the timeliness, potentially adding new requirements, as we found out through our engagements with users, with other government departments, with policy uh, makers, trying to improve the survey with all of these different resources at, at our disposal. Thinking of the way that we're designing the survey. So we are trying to put quality first, so make sure that we're not just producing a new survey, but focusing on continuous improvement across a whole range of quality measures, both the statistical and processing uh, approach and the production outputting and an analytical approach as well. The whole suite of activities going on all across ONS and trying to make this respondent centric as well. So improving the experience for the person answering the survey, the person typing in their responses, tapping the boxes, filling in the online questionnaire. And by improving that respondent experience, it then improves the quality of the data that we get and hopefully increases the inclusivity, whether there were any language barriers or comprehension barriers, whatever it might be, trying to make it as easy as possible and as inclusive as possible for people to actually answer the survey. And trying to uh, make the, the design of the survey as responsive and data driven as possible. So all the information we're getting back from the respondents, from the way in which we're collecting the data, all the management information, making sure that we're in integrating that, continuously improving, changing our approach so that we are targeting the resources in the right way to the people who need them the most, and then hopefully driving up both the quality and the efficiency of the survey. Things like the whether you live in an area of deprivation, whether you have particular language skills or, or uh, disabilities or anything that you're facing, making sure that we are giving you the best possible way of answering the survey. Uh, so where the transformation has been going over the last few years, so this all started in 2016. Then in 2017, we ran our first couple of tests. So tests one and two, testing whether it could work online, what the response rates might look like online, what the engagement strategy should be at that time. And then in 2018, running yet another test, trying it mixed mode, so both online and face-to-face, -face, analyzing the effectiveness of that, analyzing the different outcomes, analyzing the difference in modes, whether it uh, made a, a change to the responses that we were getting. And then heading into 2019 and 2020, the final tests leading up to having an online survey active, especially since the, as a result, response to the pandemic, when the current LFS was struggling because it was based face to face first, introducing the online mode as a supplementary measure, as an alternative measure of collecting the data and information so that we were collecting as much as we could in the best possible way. And that 2020 uh, introduction of the survey that is still live, it is still running. Obviously things have been changing over the course of time, but back in March and April 2020 was when technically the TLFS first went live to the public and has been going ever since. 
but more recently since 2022. So back in February 2022, we introduced a telephone mode as well. And then in April, we reached the target sample size. So going out to all the people that we were expecting to go out to, giving them the online option and the telephone option. And then over the coming few months, adding more content into the survey. So all the key labor market content was included from September 2022. And then in November and April and since then, implementing and expanding our field work capacity. So a process called knock to nudge, which all of will come on to, but going out to people's houses and making sure that we're getting responses from them through all the different modes that we have available to us. Leading towards uh, July, when we've been conducting uh, peer review processes, so presenting the data as it currently is to a bunch of reviewers, uh, both uh, in departments, in devolved administrations and a few uh, economic experts as well. And the reason this is colored orange rather than green, this is still ongoing. So this peer reviewing has been going on since July, analyzing, investigating the data, finding any problems or issues or any questions that people have so that we are refining and improving and, co and correcting any problems that we find in the survey. Leading towards where we are now in November. So we've implemented a couple of final changes, one change in October, one change coming up in a couple of weeks time. These will be the final substantive changes to the design and the content of the survey going forward. There will obviously be an ongoing process 2024, 25, 26. We will continue with improvements and, uh, and updates going forwards. But for this iteration of the survey, for this current change for the TLFS right now, these will be the final changes that we're making at this stage. Leading towards January, when the aim is that we decommission the current LFS, because the transformed survey has met the quality criteria that we've set for it, it can then become the primary source of information for labor market statistics. And of course, given all the breadth of other questions and variables in the survey, the primary source of information for a bunch of those as well. Leading towards in March and in May, the first key publications based upon this new TLFS data. So the labor market statistics produced in March and then in May, based upon TLFS data and the first release for, of formal TLFS microdata currently aiming for May for that to happen. So in May, that will be the January 2024 to March 2024 quarter of TLFS data when it is the official source of statistics from that point. At which stage you've heard plenty enough from me. So handing over to Orla, Orla, over to you. Thank you, James. So I'm going to take you through a little bit more about some of the detail of the design, the development process we've been through over the last few years and let you know a little bit more about what the new survey really looks like and what that means for you. Move on to the next slide. But thank you. So this is a little bit about the, the design of the survey. So as James mentioned, this is quite a different survey from the LFS. It's an online first survey and that means it comes with multiple other changes as well. We've got a much larger household um, sample size rather. So we've got 140,000 uh, households that were invited to take part on the transformed labour force survey um, at wave one each quarter. Um, and then from there, it changes again a little bit where we have half of that sample receives a shorter questionnaire and um, which complains, contains all the kind of core labour market content and socio-demographic content, all the education questions, etc. as well. But then we've also got half the population, half of the sample rather, that received this slightly extended questionnaire. So our TLFS plus questionnaire, which has a few more additional questions, um, which enables us to ask a few more questions of those people at that point in time. One of the other differences with the current labour force survey is that we then don't rotate all of that entirely very large sample through to wave two, three, four and five. We choose to take just a portion of those. So it's 40,000 of the original 140,000 that are then rotated into our wave two sample. Um, and that is then carried forward that full sample all the way through wave two, three, four and five in a similar way to the current uh, labour force survey. Um, but that is the way in which we've got this much larger wave one sample enables us to look at more things to be able to provide that more detailed data to enable us to be able to provide um, more more data to for to support essentially the more detailed uh, analysis that you might like to conduct. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So to go into a bit more detail about the sample design itself. So rather than using uh, half the current um, frame for the uh, current labour force survey, the 
transformed survey uses uh, a new um, sample frame. So that's the dress brace premium, which is based on um, a, a series of data, including kind of ordinary survey, geoplace product, complied with kind of local authority data, it includes uh, council tax data, royal mail data, and other things as well. And this is updated very regularly, so it enables us to get the most up to date uh, data that we can on the quality of those addresses as well. Um, this includes private households only, no communal establishments, and this is a place where, where actually the address based data is, is quite effective in enabling us to be able to identify the different types of addresses in the sample, so enable us to be more accurate at excluding those communal establishments uh, at the beginning of the survey, and, uh, and therefore you know, reducing the number of ineligible addresses that we get across the survey as well. Uh, it's a systematic random sample within England, Wales and Scotland, so all households in the frame uh, have, have a, an equal probability of being selected and that's within each of those countries. Um, so within Wales and uh, Scotland, we have a, a boosted sample. And that means that they have a larger, relatively greater kind of sample overall. But within those countries, there's still an equal probability of being, uh, being sampled relative to the population size. So rather than the LFS, we've got different local authority boosts at different areas. On the transformed survey, you've got essentially an equal kind of um, representative sample, um, at least within, within England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and that sample is also representative for every single week. So we uh, we issue samples on a weekly basis and each of those weeks is representative kind of across the, the geographic areas as well. Um, and uh, those those we can determine essentially the, the size of those samples, the relative size across um, each of the, the regions and the areas according to the media population estimates for each um, country and um, within the English regions as well. Um, now, I've talked about England, Wales and uh, Scotland. NISRA are actually conducting their own transformation of the survey in Northern Ireland. So that's done entirely separately. So what I'm going to focus on here is really what we're doing to England, Wales and Scotland, um, although we will be producing UK level estimates with the NISRA data as well. They're conducting their own transformation on a slightly different timeline. So um, I talked about the, the initial sample size being 140,000 households being invited to take part at each quarter, which represents a much larger wave one issued sample compared to the current survey. Um, if we then translate that to look at what that means for the achieved sample size, so what, how much data are you actually going to get relative to what you're getting at the moment? Um, this just gives an example and there's more detail here alongside this in our user guides. So the link at the end of this slide pack as well that will enable you to see um, what this is look at this in more detail. Um, and so here we've got the economically active individuals uh, in a quarterly and annual data set, and we tried to provide something kind of similar. Um, so the transformed survey covers both the equivalent of the, the um, labour force survey and the annual population survey. We will be producing both quarterly and annual data sets from this one transformed survey. Um, and you get a much larger um, kind of data set size. And this is these are conservative estimates here because, for example, we've included the data brought forward on the LFS, <coughs> excuse me, um, which uh, which we currently don't do on, on the transformed survey. Um, but um, so here you can see that it's um, it's kind of roughly um, double the size of, of some of those data sets um, and in some cases um, more than that um, on your data sets. Um, and again, we'll provide some figures, I think, in, in the user um, guides as well, which provide some of the issues sampled by local authority and things like that. So I, I urge you to go and look at that if you're interested in more detail. So what does this actually mean for the respondents who are taking part in terms of the survey design for those people? Um, so we start at the beginning, we send them a pre-notification letter. And the difference with this being an online survey is that we have to do everything via mail. We have to invite people to take part and we have to ensure that they actually open that mail and take part. So our pre-notification letter is there to encourage encourage people to, or to, to make them aware of what the survey is all about, so they're more likely to then open the letter when they finally receive their first invitation letter a week later. So their invitation letter includes an access code that enables them to go online and complete the survey online. It also includes a telephone number so that they can phone up and make an appointment to, uh, to complete via telephone should they wish to do it that way as well. The following week, we send a further reminder letter that again has their access code to encourage them to respond at that point. So what we're trying to do is to encourage as many people as possible to respond without us having to, to, to intervene, I suppose, for them to be able to just get their letter, open it and choose to take part and to do so online if they can do so or telephone if not. Um, but 
we know that not everybody will take part if we just invite them to do so. So we need to have some way of following up those people. And this is where we try to use our um, our resources to try and 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 focus it on those people who haven't responded at that point. So this is where we start a knock to nudge visit. So this is, these are the times when we, we go out onto the doorstep and actually engage in a face to face manner. We don't complete the quest, the, the, the interview on the doorstep, but we do provide new access codes. We collect telephone numbers to uh, enable us to be able to phone them up and complete that interview via telephone if needed or to encourage them to respond online if they can. And week four is then the end of the collection period. Um, so over that period of time, we try to encourage people to respond by themselves at the beginning um, with increasing the level of intervention through those reminder letters and then knock to nudge visits and uh, follow up telephone calls where we have their phone number um, throughout that period to encourage um, maximum level of response. So one of the other ways in which we have to encourage people to respond is by you, the use of incentives. So this is important not just to get people to respond, but also to um, to look at the types of people who are likely to take part. So there are always some people who are likely who will complete a survey um, no matter what what you ask them to do. But we found that incentives and um, particularly physical incentives um, something that they can feel in an envelope makes it more likely for people to just to open the envelope when they get their invitation to take part. And we've done a fair bit of work on on this recently we used to send out some tote bags which had a real squishability factor where actually you know you get something through the door and you think oh what is this I'm more likely to rip it open and and not just chuck it in the mail with your Domino's leaflet um, but actually we've we've looked at kind of the relative value of these things and so now we've looked at kind of these notepads which we're sending out at the moment which provide an almost equal impact to the tote bags but is much more kind of environmentally friendly but it's still this kind of hard thing that you want to feel you want to know what's inside the envelope um or hopefully uh, and open it and use that so we've done some some tests to see the impact of that and that was a lot more effective than for example just providing more money to, to, to encourage people to take part so we have offered kind of vouchers at the beginning as well but that was less effective than just a, a notepad and that's key for driving up that level of response. But we also provide that £10 um, e-voucher for everybody, every household rather, that um, takes part at the end once they've completed the survey, once everybody in their household has taken part in that survey, to encourage them to get all the way through the questionnaire. It's an online questionnaire. Again, you have to have slightly different techniques to encourage people to get all the way through and not give up um, kind of part of the way through as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we want to focus on quality and it's not just about uh, increasing the overall level of response. Um, we want to make sure that we're getting as representative data as possible. And we do that in a number of ways, such as by looking at the impact of the various incentives that we provide and, and what impact that has on different segments of the population and encouraging them to take part. But we also look at uh, then the whole design of the survey. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we, we introduce some of that later on. Um, but our priority um, really, first of all, is to reduce the bias in the data. The overall level of response is probably less important than actually managing to reduce that level of bias, making sure that we've got the data that's as representative as possible at both national and local level. We want to be able to maximise inclusivity. We need to make sure that people are able to take part and that we're willing to take part as well. And we look at that by looking at the variability in response rather than just an overall level of response, but actually how much, how variable is that one figure that's often quoted in terms of a response rate? How variable is it across the different regions, across the index of multiple deprivation and across output area classification? It's kind of our three metrics that we're looking at the moment. So the, the ratio of response between the highest and lowest lowest performing areas across those measures so that we can then reduce that variability and target our design to focus on those most underrepresented groups, drive up response in those areas and therefore drive up the output data quality. We want to make sure that our design is kind of as proportional as possible by, by age, sex, disability, uh, tenure, ethnicity and other factors as well. But those are the key ones that we're looking at when we're looking at the impact of any of the design on, uh, on those um, on the quality of the data that we receive. We need to make sure that we're reducing attrition. So we want to make sure that when we've got this, this five wave survey, that we're maintaining those people through the survey. It's not enough for people just to take part at wave one and then go, actually, can't quite be bothered when it comes to kind of the next wave. We want to do what we can to try and keep them through those waves. And that means making sure that we've got um, sufficient sample size at wave five, that enough people are taking part to make enable kind of meaningful analysis and reducing the impact of attrition on bias. So 
not just getting as many people as possible, but actually, are we still maintaining that representative element as we get through the waves? And that's a particular challenge for us. And I think we've probably still got some work to do, but is one of our areas that we really want to focus on. And only thirdly is the is is our um, focus on on improving response. Um, response rates are often quoted as the kind of the key metric in terms of uh, the quality of the data, and we believe that actually it's more more important probably to focus on the bias and the attrition. Uh, with the response is still important um, in to, in order to to ensure that you have kind of sufficient achieved samples, but it mustn't come at a cost of the bias. Um, we must make sure that we've got as representative data as we possibly can. But clearly, um, increasing response has many other benefits as well as increasing the, the um, you, you know, your achieved sample. It obviously improves the operational complexity um, and reduces respondent burden. You're not having to invite all these people who then aren't going to take part um, and in, obviously decrease the overall cost. If you can get as many people to take part as, po as possible, you have a greater proportion of people taking part um, compared to those who've been invited to take part at the beginning. And one of the ways in which we're implementing this is through being more adaptive and responsive, being able to use all the tools that we have at our disposal to look at how we can um, manage that design to deliver something that enables us to provide that more responsive data to ensure that we're using the, re the best, uh, the most expensive resources in the right places as well and targeting them where we can really um, achieve the best value. Um, so. What we're looking at, you know, our simple kind of plan of, of, of the process is essentially you draw the sample, then you invite people to take part, you follow up the non-responders and you process the data. And any of these stages, we can look at uh, focusing on kind of reducing kind of bias and doing various things. But the bits that I want to focus on today is this, this middle bit. So the inviting people to take part in the following up non-responders, so how we do that, how we make sure that we maximise response and reduce bias at that time in order to, to optimise this response, improve inclusivity and drive up the data quality. And uh, one of the ways to do this is by being flexible in the way in which we implement our knock to nudge visits, which I've already mentioned are these, these visits where we, we visit our field interviewers, kind of visit addresses on the doorstep and encourage response. They're not trying to get uh, the people to take part in an interview then there as you would traditionally for the, the labour force survey. But we're trying to gather um, telephone numbers so that we can then phone them up later. We're trying to get that engagement with the survey. We're trying to get them to to understand why we want to take them to take part and we're providing the making it as easy as possible essentially by providing new access codes uh, etc building that report and being you know essentially less expensive enables us to make a lot more visits over the same period of time if you than if you were going to conduct kind of face-to-face -face interviews with all these people to enable people to go away and conduct you know complete the survey at their leisure as well the time that suits them most while making sure that we're getting that engagement we're explaining what we're, what it's all about particularly for those addresses where we find it really difficult to engage with them just by sending them a letter in shared households for example where there are younger people are less likely to open their mail but when we knock on the door at that point we're able to engage with them able to explain able to provide all the information they need at that point in time so that they can go away and complete the survey how do we do this well we've done this by implementing an adaptive survey design uh, an adaptive survey design is where you look at the population as a whole and the characteristics of the different people within that population. And then we segment the sample into smaller groups of similar characteristics so that you can apply alternative survey features to each group. What that means in practice is that basically you're treating different groups slightly differently. You don't have the exact same design for everyone in the population. And the way in which we're doing that is by looking at where we can focus our knock to nudge resource. So if you follow up the entire group, the entire sample, um, and you then kind of have an equal probability of everybody can responding at that point, you're likely still to then get those people in those easier areas are more likely to respond to those, those, those areas where you already got overrepresented people. You don't really want to get more response from those areas. What you want to do is to be able to focus your resource on getting those underrepresented areas to take part. So what we've done is run a logistic regression model, which looks at historical actually transformed labour force survey data to look to split that into various uh, strata, which essentially uh, represent the propensity of uh, the population group to respond. So we know that the, the characteristics that are most likely to influence the response of, um, of households within a particular geographic area, so lower super output areas that we're working with at the moment, um, is actually the, the age group, so the young 
younger they are, the uh, less likely they are to take part. So those uh, LSOAs with a median uh, age group of I think, under 45, the urban and rural classification. So we know that those in the urban areas are also less likely to take part. And the index of multiple deprivation. So those most deprived areas, the IMD deciles one to four, are significantly less likely to take part. Um, than the um, least deprived areas. So we've used this to then create these different strata, which enables us to target our resources most effectively. So we're using these knock to nudge um, visits with geographic targeted for, targeting for the underrepresented sample to make sure that we're focusing our resources on improving response in those particular areas. Um, the way ASD works, our adaptive survey design, is that you can look at the options for investigating different modes of collection, different materials, incentives or timings, etc., based on these different strata to see then, well, how can we encourage response or different levels of response in different groups, depending on their propensity to respond. Um, what this is key um, is in, in doing, essentially, is to understand more about um, how to improve that representativity. So it's not just about increasing the overall level of response, um, which you get a higher level of response if you followed up all households, but you'd also get a much higher level of bias in that data as well. So by targeting it, by reducing the variability in response across areas, you're improving that representativity, reducing the bias in the data and um, reducing that, that, um, the, the challenges that we've got in, in some of um, the data quality. So I think in the next slide, I'll be able to tell you a little bit about the different the different strata that we're using. So um, I mentioned the urban, the less deprived and the or rather the more deprived and the um, the age, the younger age groups as being those that are less likely to take part. So from those category and from those variables, we're able to then assign every um, lower super output area across Great Britain um, into one of these strata and effectively then determine which our priority areas are. So this first iteration of this um, adaptive survey design is relatively simple, that those in the strata two, three, four, five, that's those urban uh, areas that are more deprived um, and that are younger or urban more deprived and slightly older as well. Um, uh, basically, this is the combination of, of those variables which enables us to um, optimally use our resources to target those underrepresented groups and reduce that um, the bias in the data improve its representativity. So those are the ones that we're going out to. So essentially we have, we split the sample into two effectively. So you've got those that are in those strata two, three, four, and five. Those are the priority cases. Those are the ones that are getting field visits versus the other ones um, that we determine essentially that they won't be followed up. So you can see this chart here. It looks at the um, response, the return rate here by day during the operation. So across the 28 days. Now, in the first two weeks, if you remember, we send out the invitation letter. We send out a reminder letter. We don't do make any kind of knock to nudge, any doorstep visits at that point in time. So at day 14, you can see here this dark blue line. They're the cases that will be getting field um, visits. They will be getting those knock to nudge visits. And you can see that at that point in time, there's a significant difference in the response rate for those areas um, compared to those which we have deemed to be um, not needing essentially those, those knock to nudge visits. Those are the case, uh, essentially the less deprived areas, the areas with the older groups the, the, and the um, more rural areas as well. Um, but you can see that once we implement that knock to nudge visits, once those dark blue lines actually start getting the visits from day 14 on, that brings that value up and reduces the difference in response across those following two weeks to the point where you've almost joined those together and reduced the disparity between your two groups. So again, you're reducing the, um, the difference between your two groups and um, reducing the variability in response and therefore increasing the representativity of your data. And you can see that and compared to essentially our grey um, line, which is actually before we introduced not to nudge at all. And at that point, um, it was a very kind of flat line. Nothing much was happening for the final two weeks. Um, so you can see that overall we've increased response, but we've also reduced variability since the introduction of those uh, not to nudge visits. Now move on to the next slide, please, which shows um, some of the work that we've done on the questionnaire redevelopment. So it's not just about the overall design and the sample, but actually what the questions that we ask. Um, so as James alluded to at the beginning, the LFS is very long. A lot of those questions have been on there for a very, very long time. What we want to do when we're looking at transforming the survey is about looking at 
the, the um, all of those questions, but also if we're transforming to an online first survey, we need to make sure that it works um, for from a respondent centred um, approach. We need to make sure that the people who are asking to take part understand the concepts that we're asking them and that that is then meeting that that end data user need. We want to make sure that you're getting the data that you need by ensuring that the respondents also understand the concepts that they're being asked and improves the quality of the data. And when you have a face to face survey um, or even a, a telephone survey, you've got an interviewer there to help explain, to help expand, to help provide a little bit more guidance around that. We need to do extra work when it comes to transforming to an online survey to make sure that that's as self-explanatory as possible to ensure that the respondents um, provide as consistent um, responses kind of as possible as well. They're interpreting the questions in the way that we expect them to do so. So we do that through this respondent centred approach by looking first at understanding and meeting the user need, not just the definition, but understanding then what that means for those respondents, um, ensuring that both the collection is both respondent centred and inclusive. So we're not excluding particular groups of the population and that they understand what is required from them in taking part. That we're reducing the burden very much so that we're making it as easy as possible for them to take part. Um, we need to use the data to design to actually show what we need to be able to be doing and to take this optimode approach. So um, while it is online first, it's not online only. We do have about 8% of people uh, of households at the moment are completing our transformed survey uh, via telephone as well. And we want to make sure that we're focusing on both how we can ask the same questions via two different modes and ensure that we're not introducing any additional uh, mode effects there. And we're looking at the impact of that and in when we're designing these questions as well. Um, we're looking then at how we do this through the different um, flow and cognitive testing. So we're actually understanding the mental models behind some of this work so that the respondents uh, understand the kind of the impact, both the, the concept that we're asking them and the particular information that we're asking for. Uh, and maintaining consistency with standards and time series where possible is also uh, uh, really important when we're looking at what's currently being asked on the Labour Force survey and what we're asking on the transformed survey. And I think I've got an example next. Exactly. So one of these examples of actually when some of the work that we've done here is in looking at kind of employment in the reference. This sounds quite a simple concept um, where it says you know, uh, on the LFS, did you do any paid work in the, in the week ending uh, Sunday date, either as an employee or a self-employed? And when we actually tested that with some users, we looked, you know, as a self-response survey, people said, well, no, no, I didn't do any pay. I just did my normal job. You know, the, this concept of work isn't always something that we think might be quite straightforward. But actually, in terms of what um, what these respondents from all sorts of different backgrounds might be might be interpreting is slightly different. Some people said, well, do you, I did I did paperwork. Does that count? Um, and they're kind of uncertain how to respond to this. So then we looked at, well, how can we rephrase that question? How can we go back out and test it again with the users to see how they would interpret it? So then we tried, well, did you do any work for pay? payment or profit, including self-employment uh, in the week ending Sunday. And, um, you know, they said, you know, I, I still said yes, because I still get holiday pay. But do I do I do I need to answer this or not? And they're a little uncertain. They were on. I was on holiday, so I was paid. Does this count or not? Um, and so then we think, well, OK, what about um, if you've got, you know, if you're self-employed as well, what happens? What do we say then? So then we tried, do you have a paid job or business in the week, um, Monday to Sunday? The job was a fairly easy concept. I had a job. It doesn't matter whether you're away from it or not at that point in time. It was quite easy to, to enable us to, to, um, to ask that question for people to understand it. Um, but then we had that, that issue with, well, they were paying themselves a wage, but nobody was paying the company. It's slightly complicated. The question you're talking about is if it's a business or not. So, so we didn't quite meet the needs for all of the population. So these sole traders in particular found this slightly more challenging to, to respond to. So then we went with, um, did you have a paid job either as an employee or self-employed in the week, Monday to Sunday? Um, and this we found better captured the different types of self-employment um, and, and it made it a little bit easier for people to take part. Now we've gone a step further from this as well, where we said even if people said no at this point later on, we've then asked them, well, do you uh, did you own or operate a business in any of that period of time to make sure that we were still capturing some of those self-employed people who might have said no um, because they didn't do any, they didn't have a paid 
job necessarily, but they still owned or operated a business in that period of time. So that kind of gives an example of the sort of iterative process that we go through to make sure that these questions are actually fulfilling the, the, the user need that, um, that is required. And there are a number of ways and places in which we've implemented kind of some of these new approaches and done some kind of different things to try and absolutely optimize the data quality. Um, one of those is industry and occupation. So this is a particular challenge when you're when you're asking these questions online uh, compared to where you've got an interviewer who can probe many times. But one of the ways in which we've we've uh, enabled us to be able to um, to use the information that respondents provide when we ask them about their industry and occupation is by using um, this automated coding system that we've adapted from some of the census technology that we used there where we were trying to um, do a very similar kind of process. So what we've done is we've got this new machine learning automated coding process and um, that tells us about the confidence of the matching. So it lets us know actually um, how uh, how confident we are in in the the output of that coding tool. But then we've got some auto, some kind of clerical coding as well. So we've got people looking at these, these codes and, and manually kind of coding some of this stuff. And we're able to then make those direct comparisons, which not only then tells us what, um, what's different from the, from the clerical coders, but helps us to then use that information to feed it straight back into that machine learning automated coding. So we can then improve those tools as uh, iteratively as we go on as well and reduce that need for clerical matching. Um, we've got methodological tailoring, so um, we talked about the sample differences um, between the labour force survey and the transformed survey. Um, so we did a full review of that, that sampling and the stratification to come up with something that best met, met kind of user needs to deliver a representative sample. Um, We've learned from some of the alterations during the pandemic, particularly around the weighting, the introduction of different uh, variables and the different data sources that we used um, to look at those population totals as well, uh, by integrating the latest census and population figures as well to update some of those um, some of that uh, that estimation methodology and using an approved approach to imputation and editing as well reviewing the current process on the LFS and looking at how we can make those better and better meet kind of user needs as well. Quality of work is another topic where we've done some more work to look at actually what the impact of that is for users and we've actually gone out and and there's been a full advisory panel to look at actually what the, the real requirement is there and how we can better fulfill the user need for that data, including adding new questions, improved analysis and outputs and enabling us then to have that more targeted policy interventions as a result of the improved data that they get that you'll get on the survey. It's not just about the respondents and the data users, it's about actually the production system as well, uh, which enables us to provide um, this data to process it through a much more secure system on the latest platforms. Uh, we use Python, our open source kind of modular software to enable us to be able to build that, to be able to process the data um, and using the latest lookups and standards. Um, but making sure that we've got this end-to-end this -end flow and that it's optimised to work as efficiently and effectively as possible, reducing that, that requirement for manual intervention as well. So I think that's the the end of my overview of the overall design. I think I'll hand back to James to talk about actually where we are now. So that's the development what we've done so far, um, but we haven't finished yet. So James. Lovely. Thank you very much, Orla. And hopefully I'm back on. Hopefully you can hear me again. I'll, I'll leave the camera. Fingers crossed. Uh, so where are we now? Uh, well, the current performance. Uh, so I've stolen this from Orla. Sorry, I know this is your favourite topic. So the current response rates to the TLFS, the transformed survey, are looking around about the 39% mark. So 30% full response and 9% partial response, leading to an overall response, uh, return rate of about 39%. And you can see that in the blue bars, both on the left and the right. So on the left-hand diagram, it's week by week. So the different cohorts of people, and you can see the lighter colored bars they're the cohorts still out in the field, so they're still being collected, so that's why they're lower. And you can see over the course of time, as we get more and more responses, they come up to where the darker blue bars are. So that's us monitoring the process on a week, week by week basis, making sure we're getting all the responses we can. On the right hand side, it's probably more familiar to you thinking about quarters. So you can see there the response rate quarter by quarter by quarter. 
and you can see uh, a big jump happening towards the right hand side. So January to March, April to June, July to September. That's when we uh, had implemented knock to nudge processes that uh, that all I was talking through. That's when we started to see even increased response rates by a good five percentage points or so compared to where we were before and still working on that. Hopefully that'll increase over the course of time as well. Thinking uh, of some of the measures that Orla mentioned, so on the left hand side, looking by indices of multiple deprivation. So uh, I forgot to add the label, sorry. Uh, category one on the left hand side are the most deprived areas. Category 10 on the right hand side are the least deprived areas. And you can see the, the difference in, in response rates from each different uh, in index of de deprivation there. But the key target here is that the response rate from the least deprived areas is within double the response rate of the most deprived areas and we are around about that at the moment so just shy of 30 percent compared to just shy of 50 percent we are within that tolerance limit that quality standard of course we're still working to improve this still trying to change things as best as we can but this is an improved representative representativity in comparison to the current lfs on the right hand side i've also put there a diagram of the response rates by local area excluding Northern Ireland because uh, we haven't got the responses from there just yet. But for the rest of Great Britain, you can see there the responses by local area. I won't pick out anywhere in particular. It's quite a, a big, detailed, complicated diagram. But you can see there that the, the more rural areas getting slightly better responses than the more urban areas. But this is still a work in progress. Uh, watch this space. And if you want to, you can zoom into that diagram in your own time to find your own local area. So some changes that are being made now and early next year. So I mentioned earlier the final transition states happening last month and in the coming couple of weeks. So we've been improving some of the translations to the survey materials, uh, especially the, the survey is available in English and in Welsh and in a printed, so to speak, form. So improving the translations that we have in the, the materials that are available to people. Changing some of the questions. So all that was going through about the employment status a minute ago. We've also made some changes to the disability questions, the health and safety questions. Uh, we've added a question about trade union membership, removed questions about internet usage, and we've upgraded the well-being questions. They were previously in the half sample. They're now in the full sample. So everybody is now getting asked the well-being questions. So those changes are, are fundamental changes to the content. We've also had a few mechanical adjustments, some behind the scenes things that you may not notice about the routing and the locking and the handling of individual questions. So some mechanical technical things in the actual design of the survey. Part of this is also feeding into the user guidance. So all of those changes, all that we've been doing to this point, are feeding into the next iteration of user guidance. So there's already a, a web page available online with the uh, background uh, methodological information, with the sample sizes, with the, uh, the metadata about the variables in the data set, with an example of what the data set looks like and some other information as well. All of that's available on the web page. We're expecting to update that in January. So watch out for version three of all that information coming out. And as we touched on earlier, the other changes that are coming up we are incorporating the latest released population figures. So they came out a few days ago. We're trying to incorporate them into the system in both LFS and TLFS, and that's likely to happen January, February time. Uh, and we're also building finally the production processing systems. A lot of the focus has been on the quarterly person files, but we're now adding in the annual files, the longitudinal files, the household files, integrating all the GB and Northern Irish figures all into the processing system over the coming three, four, five months. So hopefully it'll all be there ready for when we formally transition in March and May when those labour market publications go out. Uh, we've also been doing an awful lot of work as far as analysis, evaluation and review. So not just the day-to-day -day monitoring of the levels of bias and resp response rates and so forth, but also with our methodological colleagues and our analytical colleagues investigating any discontinuities or indeed just the time series of an an data that is available, trying to see where the LFS and the TLFS are the same, where they're different, where they compare with each other, any differences, whether we can explain them, whether it's a reasonable difference, whether actually this was a design difference that we intended to do, or maybe this is a potential problem in the survey that possibly we need to fix. And part of that is also looking at the publications that are out there. So not just our own publications, other departments, other uh, devolved administrations, any published bulletins out there. So track, trying to track the trend lines that we can see, making sure that they're moving in the right direction and that the TLFS and the LFS are giving explicable results in, in comparison with each other. 
and not just those two surveys we're trying to look at other indicators as well so other economic indicators things like workforce jobs things like VAT returns things like PAYE tax returns uh, all sorts of business surveys and administrative data whatever we can whatever we have the time to trying to compare the TLFS against these results and see whether they're in the same ballpark whether they're moving in the same direction whether there's anything we can learn that maybe needs a, a, a tweak or an amendment somewhere and of course, part of this is the peer reviewing process. So we're working with teams all across ONS, with the devolved administrations of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, with a few other departments like the bank, the treasury, uh, uh, Department of Business and Trade, a few others, and a bunch of economic experts. So um, uh, specific expertise brought in and our fellows program, so the ONS fellows brought in to peer review the data, look at the user guidance, uh, extract some data, extract some tables, compare it to their own knowledge, their own uh, information, and then provide feedback and, and information of what they think is or isn't working, and if so, how. So what you can expect to see over the coming few months is the continued delivery of microdata. So still releasing the files wherever we can, making sure that you still have access to the information, the continued delivery of labour market tables and the releases through NOMIS, the, the NOMIS website. So all of that should still continue to be published on a regular basis and continued support and guidance and ongoing development. So not just giving you the information, but being here to answer the questions that you have, give you the documentation, the information you need, if needs be producing some ad hoc tables or some information that uh, you need extracted from the data. And as I said earlier, this is an ongoing development. So this is the first cut of information, the first massive change now, and over the course of time, adding a few more tweaks and changes and improvements over the coming months and years. This is a, a live survey that will continue to change and develop. Uh, there will be some changes to the microdata, specifically moving from SPSS format in the past to CSV format now, but there will also be changes to the variables, the variable names, the descriptions, the response options to some of these variables as well. You know, standard variables like age and sex, very unlikely to change there. They've been set in stone for arguably thousands of years, but uh, some of the variables will have changed, you know, your employment status or your family structure or whatever else from the analysis and the uh, research that we've been doing. Please be aware of the user guidance and have a look at the mapping documents that we're producing to see what may have changed that may be of interest to you. And so there will be some changes to the time series. We're doing what we can to revise the time series, make things as continuous as possible, employ the latest methodologies to both the LFS and the TLFS and the census results going back all the way to 2011. So at the top headline level, you know, the employment rate and the breakdowns at the UK level should be as continuous and consistent and, and uh uh, and non discontinuous as possible. Um, but at, when you go to lower level breakdowns, you know, if you use two, three or four variables, if you go down by age, by sex, by local authority, by disability status, for example, you may start to see some differences between the two surveys as a necessary result of the transformation and the change. So finally, from me and, and probably us as far as the presentation, we're taking this journey together with you, with all of you and with our own staff as well. So making sure that uh, our, the people collecting the data, the people processing the data, the people analyzing the data and yourselves, the users who do your own analysis, your own policy investigations, publications, whatever it might be, giving you as much information as we can. As I said, the user guidance, the next iteration is due in January. We're producing uh, qu quarterly project delivery updates. The last one was uh, last month. We're expecting the next one to be in January for where the project is going and what to expect next. Still providing all the updates we can through the newsletters, the outreach events, walkthrough sessions that we have book booked and organized. This being an example of one of those. So trying to book in outreach events with people wherever possible and giving uh, presentations and updates at annual conferences and events and some user groups, for example. And just finally, if you have questions, things that you want updated, things you want to be added to a, a newsletter list or whatever it is, if you get in touch through labour market transformation with any questions, problems or issues or thoughts that you have, get in touch with that email address, let us know and, and we'll uh, give you a response or bring you into whatever information we can. And that's it from me. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>